Thank you for the introduction, and I'm glad to be here today. We're going to talk a little bit about the parallels between education and healthcare, and uh, just some of the parallels that jump to mind are number one, it applies to everybody. Everybody gets educated, we hope, and everybody gets healthcare, we hope, or everybody wants those things. Uh, second thing is not everybody gets the access to either healthcare or education that they want. Third is that technology is extremely important and has made huge developments over the last 20, 30, 40 years, but the technology has not always been sufficiently applied in these two areas. And then fourth is choice is paramount. People want choice, and in these two areas, people don't often get the choice that they want. So with those thoughts, I just wanted to introduce our superstar panel. I'm going to do very brief introductions of each of them. Uh, Toby Cosgrove is immediately to my left. He is the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, President Obama's favorite healthcare institution, it seemed, during the, uh, the selling of the healthcare bill. Uh, but not just President Obama's, everybody else's as well. <laughs> We have my friend and former colleague at the White House, Douglas Holtz Eakin, who was the head of CBO. So all of those projections about uh, what healthcare costs are going to be or what education costs are going to be, you can call Doug on them right here, right now, and he will either take the blame or take credit if he got them right. He is now the head of the American Action Forum, and full disclosure, I am loosely affiliated with Think Tank. I think by that we mean I'm listed on the website. Uh, and then we have Alan Levine. And since uh, we came up with the idea for this panel, you can see his title over there, uh, but I want to make sure I get this right. So his, his, his title was Senior Vice President, Senior Advisor, the Chairman of Health Management Associates. However, he has recently been named President and CEO of the Mountain States Health Alliance. So I hope you not only listen to him, but also congratulate him on his new gig. So what I would like to do today is give each of the panelists a couple of minutes just to talk about their broad thoughts on this issue, how healthcare and education have similarities, how they are parallel, how we are trying to teach some of the lessons from healthcare, because all of us are healthcare, not education experts, although we, you know, we kind of fake it a little bit on education. Uh, so how we think the broad lessons from healthcare can be applied to education, but also a key question which is, to the extent they're not, why they are not. And so I'd like to start with Toby to give us some brief thoughts, and then we'll, um, we'll go around and ask some more questions after each of the panelists speaks. Thank you. Well, I think you've done a very nice job of uh, introducing the similarities, uh, and I think one of the similarities is now coming uh, right now to both healthcare and to education is the factor of uh, financing. Uh, and uh, increasingly we are seeing uh, the financing become a limiting factor in how we both uh, educate and how we uh, manage health care. And certainly uh, finance was one of the big drivers of health care reform that we've just uh, lived through. Um, and we're looking for ways uh, that we can begin to deal with those economic issues. One of the, if, and if you look at both education and uh, health care, both of them are heavily driven by people. Uh, if 60 percent of the cost of running a hospital, for example, is secondary to salaries and benefits, and you have the same sort of uh, big requirement uh, in education. Technology has an interesting opportunity to begin to uh, address some of that, and uh, as particularly as healthcare moves from uh, a art to a science, uh, technology is playing a bigger and bigger role in that uh, movement. Similarly, I think that there's an opportunity for education to begin to uh, uh, employ technology, and we see this going on now in the MOOCs um, and uh, in higher education. <clears throat> and you begin to look at uh, the things that are coming out uh, of places like IBM and uh, Microsoft as far as opportunities to begin to use those technologies uh, to begin to enhance the efficiency and the quality of education. I think it's uh, fairly exciting new developments. Now there are clearly a tremendous number of things that are, are not similar. Um, education right now, for example, is uh, should be lifelong, but in fact, uh, what we're talking about is a majority of it is done uh, prior to becoming 21. Uh, I think on the other end of things, healthcare, most of it is delivered well after you become 21. 
Uh, so you're dealing with a, a very large uh, difference in the population that you're working with for the most part. But these are both uh, competitive uh, for dollars, um, and healthcare has begun to eat into the education budget uh, in most states, uh, which is major concern. So there are lots of uh, similarities and uh, some major differences between the two. Yeah, I would be wary of talking a little <coughs> too much uh, about the differences on this particular panel, because the conceit of it is we're talking about the similarities, but, but they are good points that the, uh, the education comes early and much of the health care costs do come late in life, and that's something we do have to take into account. Doug. Uh, well, thank you. Well, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for the chance to be here and not in Washington. Um, <laughs> at the conclusion of the panel, I'm going to apply for asylum. and. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the asylum needs to be in Washington, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is an asylum. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I think this is a great topic. Um, uh, and uh, for openers, I'd just like to sort of sketch out a couple of different areas that we'll probably come back through in more detail. But first thing to do is to, uh, from a policy perspective, diagnose the problem accurately. And in healthcare, um, there was this dangerous one-size-fits-all notion of, of health care reform, which I, I think is a mistake. And it came from a, a tendency of too many of the policymakers to, to say that all health care is, is having a heart attack and you're in the ambulance. Everything's an acute care episode. That's how they think of it. Um, it's an imperative that everyone have it, uh, that they get it right. And, and actually, health care is an enormous spectrum of activities that range from prevention to some acute care services, but involves the coordination of people who have, you know, multiple chronic uh, diseases, and and thinking about all that heterogeneity steers you away from the notion that somehow you can fix it all with one one little plan that you you execute from the top down. And I think that's an important diagnosis you have to to think hard about in education as well. Um, uh, the, the second thing is to, I, I was thrilled to hear both the first two talk about technologies. Technologies are everything, and innovation is all, is everything about solving these problems, but incentives for the efficient uses of those technologies have to be embedded in the system as well, and I think that's something that we learn in healthcare. Uh, money is going to matter, um, no doubt about it, uh, but, but the issues in money come in three forms. One is the amount, uh, probably the least important discussion, to be honest, because um, we don't have any, but come back to that. Um, second is, who controls the money? Um, you know, we, you have to have a, a locus of control, and uh, that, that control is related to the incentives that the money carries with it. And the incentives and control are probably more important than the amounts in many cases. Uh, uh, third party payers, fee for service incentives uh, w that reward uh, uh, volume over quality outcomes are, were all characteristics that, that had to be identified in the healthcare debate. Um, and the spending as a result, um, uh, came from those incentives. And when you look at the spending, it's very important to identify how much increase in spending is being driven by prices, you know, cost of labor, things like that, and how much just from too much utilization of, of services. And I think that's, that's a lesson. And we couldn't do a very good job on that because of the inadequacy of the data. In, in education, largely due to No Child Left Behind, there's a, a tremendous amount of data now available to identify right down to the school and, and uh, uh, district and, and state. You can get at any level of aggregation what's succeeding, what's failing. Uh, having that data uh, and, and understanding how that's linked to the, to the money is a key part of uh, getting the reform right. And then um, th there's a lot of the, the medical um, problem that was really just trying to identify best practice. And uh, the data are essential for that and things, once you have a best practice, developing protocols to make sure that um, it's provided in, in the various settings. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do now in education as well. I mean, Common Core and, and things like that are, are attempts to move in that direction. So uh, those are all parts of this. And then the last one I'd, I'd end with is, it's important to think about the strategy of reform. If you want uh, to, to get it right, um, in healthcare there were really two competing visions of, of the, the reform. One was the one we did, which is cover everybody do that, and then given that you now have, in principle, um, an insurance policy for everybody, then move on to, over time, force the system to deliver uh, health care of higher quality in a more coordinated fashion. And I was always skeptical of that uh, approach because once you cover everybody and bring that many more people into the system, 
you're stretching the capabilities of the existing delivery system uh, to begin with, and then you turn around and you say, we want you to change the way you live your lives. And, and that's asking a lot, and, it's, and it, it leads to, a, I think, uh, a difficulty in getting the reform accepted at all levels in the system and, and moving through it. And um, you know, these, these guys actually run it. They can um, tell you better than I can. A different one would be to say, okay, let us drive reforms in the way we deliver education or healthcare that will free up budgetary savings at, at all levels of the system, which we can use to cover more people over time. And let's, let's find a glide path to different practices that pays, that gives us the resources to, to pay for it. That's a different strategy, one we didn't take, and one that I, I think um, might have uh, proved better. If education has a chance to think about it as well, and that, that'd be a good thing to do. You know, Doug, Doug made two points that I'd like to elaborate on briefly. Number one is he talked about the importance of having a strategy. I wish you could share this with some people in Washington because that would be a, a good lesson for them to learn. Uh, the second point. Well, they, they had a strategy. But it was We're not done. a strategy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the second point, and I, and I think the, the more, more important one, is about modesty in policy planning. You cannot do one size fits all, and you, can't al you also can't do one reform that fixes everything at once. Because you will see, if you try and address health care costs here, for example, they will pop up elsewhere. And so having a more modest approach, a less hubristic, less arrogant <coughs> approach, I think is a better way to go about reform, whether you're talking about education or health care. Alan. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit an anecdote and uh, the couple things. First, uh, the commonality I think that we're facing right now between the, the reform movement for education and healthcare is the issue of standards. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll all agree in healthcare reform, cost is, is, is one of the main drivers. Um, improving quality is a main driver, but, but I, I think you could say the same thing about education. You know, the cost and the quality of education. I serve on the Board of Governors and the State University System of Florida, and we're always talking about both things simultaneously. And the standards is the thing that brings you there. You know, the, the whole issue of Common Core isn't about some underhanded uh, uh, way to get to a, a place. It's simply about standards. And I'll give you a great example of how this has worked in healthcare. In 2004, uh, Governor, I was the Secretary of Health for the State of Florida, Secretary of Healthcare Administration, for Governor Bush. And we decided we wanted to be the first state to publish hospital outcomes for the public to see. And so we created a website called Hospital Compare, or whatever it was, uh, floridacomparecare.org. And, and we got the legislature to agree to permit us to publish outcomes. We didn't incentivize anybody. We didn't penalize anybody. It was a huge outcry. Well, you can't measure. You can't compare hospitals. Some take care of sicker people. Some take care of people that aren't as sick. It sounds familiar in education, doesn't it? Some are inner city schools, some are schools in, in, in neighborhoods where there's poverty, some are wealthy schools. The reality is, once you got past the argument about whether you could measure it or not, because we said we're gonna measure it, we're gonna do it. Um, we, we published several very simple measures. Uh, do, you know, we measured bed sores, hospital bed sore rates, post-operative sepsis, post-operative infections, um, mortality. Oh, you can't measure mortality? What do you mean, you can't measure people that die? In hospitals? I mean, yes, we can. Okay? <laughs> now, but we did do that, and we published it. We were the first state in the country to publish it. And you know, uh, I, this is a great example of when you, you're in public service and you go back to the private world, as you should, instead of staying in public service forever. Um, I went back and started running a large not for profit health system in South Florida. And we had an annual quality forums where the nurses would, would highlight uh, storyboards about their initiatives for improving quality. And lo and behold, every hospital in my system, I had five hospitals, every hospital, the nurses were focused on, on reducing bed sores, decubitus ulcers, reducing post-operative infections. And I, I said, well, why are you all picking the same thing to improve? The answer was, well, the state's measuring it, and we want to be the best. These were bedside nurses. These were the people that make it happen. And you know, all the administrative folks like me and everybody else was out there saying, you can't do this, you can't do it. Well, you did, and the net result is that people who make it happen every day, they understand what those standards mean, and they go out and they live up to those standards. No matter how much the unions and everybody else says you can't do it, you can do it. It's painful, but once it's done, and this is what I think the governor was talking about in his opening speech, once it's done, you're no longer talking about whether to measure, now you're talking about how do you improve the metrics. And that gets into a second story uh, Ronald Reagan once told uh, about a friend of his that lives in New York City. And every day he goes downstairs, 
He puts a quarter on the newsstand, but he never takes a newspaper. He does this for about six months. He goes downstairs, puts a quarter on the newsstand, but he never takes a newspaper. And finally, one day, the owner of the newsstand stopped him and said, sir, I need to talk to you. And the guy said, I know, you wanna know why I put a quarter on the newsstand every day, but I never take a newspaper. And the guy said, no, I just wanna tell you the price has gone up to 50 cents. <laughs> and and we, we deal with that in healthcare all the time. And, and it's true in education. Um, and, and I think what, what, what you've heard here, I, metrics and standards do drive improvement. The whole movement in healthcare towards value-based purchasing, yeah. it's tied to things that, eat, whether you're Republican or Democrat, you can agree on. And that is, we want whatever science shows lead to the best outcomes. We all agree we want to do those things. So what the federal government said is, okay, for the first year, we're going to take the amount of money that's in the system, we're going to cut it by 1%. We're going to take that 1%, and we're going to, we're going to measure these things, and those hospitals that do it well, we're gonna reward you for it. So they took the same amount of money that was in the system and tied it to improvement. By 2017, it'll go to 2%. Okay, so 2% of the Medicare expenditures will be shifted to rewarding improvement. And, and then at, at some point, it'll start to turn into penalties for not doing these measures and, and showing demonstrated improvement in these measures. It can and should happen for some reason in the classroom we just, we, we, we shun standards, we shun trying to measure ourselves against these things, and we make excuses why we can't do it. In healthcare, if we sit around and make excuses why we can't make sure that a, a someone who needs surgery doesn't get the right antibiotic, um, or gets an antibiotic and doesn't get discontinued the right amount of time, there's real consequences for that. In education, if we choose not to measure these things, there, there are real consequences. The difference is somebody doesn't die, somebody doesn't get an infection, but they live the rest of their life underperforming what their capabilities are because we decided it was easier not to measure them. And, and so I think, I think the lesson I've taken away in healthcare is you, you can do it in an environment where it's life and death. And if you can do it in an environment where it's life and death, you certainly can do it where, it, as like the secretary said last night, where your only enemy is uh, people wanting to feel good about themselves. If that's the only enemy, I think it can be done. Um, I'll close with this, and that is one of the areas I think in education, we're not here necessarily to talk about, but I think it's an important looming problem, and that's the issue of guaranteed student loans. And today, when you talk about pairing finance with performance, we're, we're at the college level, you've got all these students that come out not college or career ready, they enter college, they get guaranteed student loans, they end up, def the, the default rate on these student loans has increased, and they end up with debt and no degree. And, and so there's, there, at some point there needs to be a conversation about how do you tie the movement of money with guaranteed student loans towards students choosing high-performing institutions of learning, whether they're the, the colleges of today or whether they're a high-tech alternative of the future. But, but guiding those dollars towards where we know the performance results in, in high quality education. Very interesting. Do, do you want to make an immediate response to that, Toby? It's, it seemed like you wanted the mic. Uh, well, one of the things I would say is, yeah, I think that there are quality metrics that you clearly need to measure. Uh, we started, um, but it is, uh, in healthcare, it is uh, complicated a little bit. Uh, I've been at this now 25 years in cardiac surgery, and it's pretty easy to measure in cardiac surgery. You either walk out or you get carried out. Uh, so the endpoints are pretty clear. So, uh, but, the, but those quality metrics don't apply to dermatology. That's right. Uh, and so what we said was, uh, uh, 10 years ago, we said, we want every one of our institutes uh, to come together and publish their outcomes. Uh, and, you, but, and, they, and you have to develop the metrics. So each year we publish metrics uh, for whatever it is that, uh, and they're different for each one of our organizations, and we were, tr we're transparent about it. We put it on our website, et cetera. Now, the important reason for doing that is not necessarily get it out and be transparent about it. That's a, that's a terrific thing to do. The important thing is that we look at those outcomes, and we always find some place that we can do better. Mm -hmm. uh, and. It, I would also say, having started 25 years ago in cardiac surgery measuring these outcomes, that a, a patient is not a patient is not a patient. They, they have, there's a very sophisticated way to begin to risk stratify these. Uh, and it has taken us a very long term time to learn how to do that. So we've been hard at that now and been very transparent about it. But I think 
just going on about the transparency for a second, we've now got transparency around quality. The real transparency we're headed towards now is cost. Yep. And we do not have transparency in cost. And can you imagine going to buy a car and you'll say, gee, that looks like a nice Mercedes. I'd like to have one of those. And then you find out how much, you've got to find out how much it costs. You know, you go in to have a sigmoidoscopy, you got the slightest idea how much it costs. And it costs different all over the place. We're, that's changing. And that's changing from the government's beginning to change it as they're starting to publish these uh, costs. And interestingly, there's a very interesting push right now, full disclosure. Uh, my wife works for a company called Castlight, which now has gone and figured out how much things cost at various hospitals. And you can go into San Francisco and you can find out that there's a three-fold or four-fold difference in the cost of a, very, of a chest x-ray or a uh, colonoscopy uh, from hospital to hospital. They're then turning around and giving that information back to uh, the, uh, and the individual uh, companies so they can tell their employees it's going to cost you so much more in your copay to go here than it is to go over there. That's real transparency. And that's coming now from the private sector and it's also coming from the public sector. And, and that will begin to change and drive value for your healthcare dollar. Yeah, let me make a couple, a couple of points on, on both um, Alan and, and Toby's comments. Uh, first of all, I just uh, need to react to the newspaper story that Alan told. It reminds me a little bit of the scene at the beginning of the movie Manhattan by Woody Allen, in which Woody Allen goes up to the New York Times box, puts in a quarter, that's how much it cost back then, takes out the New York Times, reads the headline, and then is so mortified that he puts in another quarter and put, returns the newspaper to the box. <laughs> um, also, uh, we mentioned uh, my, my book earlier about presidents and pop culture. President Carter saw that movie Manhattan three weeks, twice within the three weeks from within which the movie opened. So he was obviously uh, a big fan of that movie. Uh, the second point on uh, Toby about metrics, it's really important to be careful about the metrics that we choose to measure because what Toby is saying is that the staff is aware of what those metrics are. It's kind of like the old Hawthorne effect. You know, people act differently when they know they're being measured. But here, they know they're being measured on these specific things. And so they work hard to improve in those specific categories. And if you pick the wrong metrics, the wrong things will improve. And so that's very important. Uh, the second point about transparency, uh, I am a big fan of Castlight. You can uh, t tell your wife that. Um, it's, a, a, it's a great company and it really has an ability to be transformative about healthcare. Uh, this obviously applies to education. I mean, if we really knew uh, how education breaks down the costs of administrators or um, the, the costs of uh, what, how much they're spending on actual classroom learning versus all the other side stuff, um, and also what the real results of education, which schools are truly better. I mean, these uh, some of the grades that schools get, I uh, you know Bloomberg in New York had a kind of a, a grade for each school and there was criticism that the grades were seen as overly subjective. So if you can get, get objective measures in education it is a, extremely important. But the transparency problem, even though we have better technology available today, is not necessarily going away. I just read this piece by Ovik Roy in Forbes in which he was talking about the many glitches of the ACA websites. And the glitches, we, I mean, everybody on both sides of the aisle can agree that the, the glitches were uh, not, not only shocking, but un unconscionable given the amount of time they had to prepare this. But he argues that one of the reasons that the websites have been so glitchy is that they're trying to mask the true cost of premium hikes. And so they don't make it very apparent and not easy to c comparison shop prices between what the prices are now and what they were in the past. And that kind of workaround or that, that non-direct form of having you sign up for the, for the websites has contributed to the glitches. So we need to be careful that government is not getting in the way of transparency, but the government is providing more transparency. Um, I was going to have some questions, but it sounds like you both have active things to say on this. So Doug. So I, I just want to emphasize in. the importance of, uh, of just providing the data. And, and, and that, you know, when I um, left the Congressional Budget Office, I was uh, appointed to the to Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, that's where they send old CBO directors to die. And um, <laughs> um, w well, there was this startling moment where we, we took the data for episodes of care. And um, instead of just all the, the different procedures that were done, you look at the entire episode, pre-admission tests, in the hospital, 
actual service in the hospital, post uh, uh, discharge follow up, look at the whole episode, um, adjust for the, the illnesses, uh, the, the health status of the, of the patient, and look at how much it costs. And, and th there are these huge variations in costs within counties. And um, just for fun, we, we, we had some urology uh, data, and, and we, we, we literally just contacted the doctor and said, are you aware that your guys cost six times what the guy next door do? And, and no, I mean, I had no idea. Really, is that true? And just telling them changes the behavior enormously. I mean, they, they start to ask, you know, how do you treat your patients? And it has an enormous uh, impact. So even if you do not yet know what metrics you want to drive people toward, measuring and showing people what's going on out there is very valuable. It, it really will change things in and of itself. Um, if you can't get to metrics on outcomes, which is what everyone always wants, um, it is still valuable, I think, to start with intermediate metrics on process. Are you doing these things? Um, we know that you probably should do some of those things. I have always been stunned that Head Start has no such uh, metrics built into it. I mean, this is supposed to be a health program so that kids can arrive at school capable of learning, and no one ever asks, did they even see a doctor? <laughs> I mean, you know, run, if you're going to put that kind of money into something, have some metrics, at least on a process front, that show that, that you're, you're using it effectively. And the use of the data and the metrics is essential to getting the technology efficiently deployed. You know, there's always this dream that the, the magic app is going to save us. We just get the magic app and we hand it out and life's gonna be good. But, you know, you can spend trillions of dollars on healthcare technology, for example, and, it, and it's just like buying everyone an almanac and putting it on their desk. If they have no reason to open it up and use it, it doesn't do any good. And until you have a, a, a real interest in knowing the, 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 the subtle variations in the health status of the person who's in front of you, and you have a, a real business interest in getting the right outcomes for that person, and you have a financial incentive to try to do it I at a reasonable cost, having a fabulous electronic system doesn't do, any, do anything for you. It's just there, and it's just expensive, and it makes things worse, not better. So, I worry when people come up with purely technological solutions, and that and I'll close with just my take on the ACA websites. What's wrong with those websites is there's no financial incentives to run well. The New York Stock Exchange, and exchange has worked very well for a long time. The exchange makes money when people can trade effectively. And those exchanges are a purely technological approach to solving a problem, and they always fail. There has to be a business model underneath the technology. I think the couple couple of things, um, I was just jotting down a couple notes. First, just to give you order of magnitude, to compare sort of the private sector reform model that, that has been deployed in states like Florida and Louisiana where we measure and we have, we have accountability and, and, and more transparency with outcomes. Just to give you an order of magnitude, the website for uh, the federal government for HHS uh, with reform costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 million. Okay, the two Mars rovers combined cost 800 million. They actually work on Mars. Okay, uh, I mean it, we, we spent 600 million dollars on a website, the More transparency actually. website we deployed in Florida to compare hospital outcomes where we risk adjusted, cost 200 thousand dollars. So I I don't understand the the you know the the top down central planning model of this is how we're going to develop. A system, a systemic reform. It can't happen that way. That's why Common Core was developed by governors and states because it was developed to be a bottom-up approach to developing real standards that everybody could agree were the relevant standards. And, and you know, you made a great point um, when you talk about making sure the standards are relevant. I, I use this analogy of you know lions, antelopes, and chipmunks. I mean, lions could spend all day running around eating chipmunks. They can catch them pretty easily, but if they spend all their time eating chipmunks, they're going to starve to death, and they're going to spend all their energy on not being properly, you know, not getting the proper nutrition. What lions need to do is stop, sit, wait, and go after the antelope, right? That's, they can eat, they can have, they're, they're preserving their energy for things that matter. In our industry, if we run and chase metrics just for the sake of chasing metrics, same yeah, thing for education. You're going to waste all your time and energy going after the metrics that don't matter, and as the lion does, you'll starve to death. You got to focus on the things that matter, and and develop a willingness to go fight to get those things done. 
And, and I think once you move that ball, that becomes the new level of conversation. You're not sitting back there talking about chipmunks anymore. And, and just to bring the technology into this, um, Doug mentioned this, it's a really true point. I remember when we, we, the other website we published, we started in 2005, was called MyFloridaRx.com. And our objective was simply to measure the cost of pharmacy, the top 100 pharmaceuticals, same dosage, same drug, same brands. We published it. We found pharmacies literally down the street from each other, there was a hundred dollar difference in the cost of the drugs. And, and it, it, it's amazing how quickly that gap closed once it became public. And you know, and it, was, it cost nothing for us to go out there. We had to make sure we were comparing apples to apples, make sure that we pushed all the variables out that we needed to. Last point about technology. I, I, um, Toby mentioned the MOOCs um, and, and the, the, the movement in education towards the use of technology and online <coughs> learning. Well, I, I don't remember whether it was Harvard or, or, or uh, Michigan or Michigan State, I don't remember who it was, but the professor that's developed um, you know, the ability to measure keystrokes in learning so that we identify, if you're teaching algebra or geometry or whatever it is, the ability to find out exactly where people make their mistakes individually and then target where they make their mistakes. That's where technology, that's where the puck is going. And whether it's healthcare or education, if we don't figure out, or I should say, we have to figure out how to harness that technology. If you can consider how much more efficient we would be in educating people, if you could target your effort, instead of the least common denominator, you're focused on each person's individual weakness and you can provide the input to help them overcome that obstacle. That's how you're gonna see a huge advancement in people's achievement. That, that, that's a really good point, and it leads into the, the next section of the panel. Uh, the idea about the, the $600 million website, which is just an astonishing number. I've actually heard it's $693 million, so it's, it's closer to $700 million, which is even more frightening. I mean, what does it, what, but, did, what did you, what? But, but it I mean, gets, through, <laughs> but, but here's the point, really and this relates to education, which is government is not the most efficient dispenser of resources. They don't spend <laughs> dollars as efficiently as the private sector, and this is also very closely related to education, that more money spent by government will not lead to better results, either in healthcare or in education. And so if money is the metric, that is not the successful way of going about it. And, and I will lead to a question, and you will, um, you will go first, Toby, on this question. But the, this leads to the question of how do we get money spent more efficiently? And there's been a movement towards pay for results, uh, value-based purchasing, and um, there's some resistance to it in the healthcare world because there, there's, um, what, what are results? There's uh, vagueness about the notion of results, but there's also uh, some recognition that this could be the way to solve our problem and get more efficient distribution of resources. So I would like to ask Toby first to answer this question about the, this movement towards pay for performance in healthcare and ask the other panelists to weigh in on this as well. Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say that I think there's a, a, a tremendous opportunity that's coming in healthcare uh, that is brought about by less money in the system. And if you look at uh, healthcare in the United States, uh, it is really not a system. There are, every hospital sits as an independent. Uh, every doctor and is an entrepreneur, uh, generally, and works by himself. Uh, and what is happening now is as money comes out of the system, all of a sudden the hospitals are starting to say, we've got to do the same things that happened in the airlines. If you look at hospitals across the United States, the margin is 2.5%. It's not a high margin industry. And 20 years ago, 35, uh, 35 airlines consolidated into four. Uh, and we no longer see the mom and pop grocery store or the, the local bookstore or, and the same thing has happened in professions. If you look at law firms and you look at uh, consulting firms and uh, the, uh, all of major industries in the United States have driven efficiency by consolidation. And that's exactly what's going on in healthcare right now. It's huge uh, consolidation. 60% of the hospitals are now part of a system. Systems are starting to talk to systems. Doctors uh, all used to be uh, individuals and now 60% and some places, some people think 70% of physicians are now salaried. Uh, and uh, as that happens, uh, we're beginning to develop a, a system uh, of healthcare delivery. Just an example, uh, recently we spent $170 million to build a data center for the Cleveland Clinic. That's a lot of money. 
uh, in any healthcare system, and it doesn't take care of it, make any patients any better. There's, a, there's another system that is coming, is going to join us, and one of the principal things that they want to do is not have to repeat that same investment, but in fact, use ours. Uh, so the, the, the uh, drive to take money out is going to ultimately wind up in a better, more coordinated system of healthcare delivery, uh, and it's going to also, they, just by the way, it's also going to do a couple things. It's going to take. It's going to close hospitals across the country. We've got too many beds in the United States, um, it, which is going to come as a huge shock uh, to a lot of communities as their hospitals get uh, closed. Uh, it's going to be a little bit like base closings. Uh, anyone but mine um, is is going to is what's going to happen. So we we can begin to see uh, uh, an analogy here at education. I mean, take education, let's go away from the schools for a second, let's go to the, the colleges. <coughs> I mean, every college has to have its own athletic fields, its own admissions office, its own everything, you know, you go down the whole stream of things. You know, can we afford that? Is there a more efficient way to do it? I think probably is, and it probably would come about if there's less money in the system. Doug? Um, I, I always laugh when, uh, you know, we have these discussions and we say we want to move to pay for performance and people would be, be startled by the notion. What else would you pay for? <laughs> I mean, you know something's really wrong when that's considered a radical notion. <laughs> and uh, there are a lot of similarities between uh, health and education. Um, they, they are two sectors of the economy that have for too long been characterized by um, uh, large open-ended subsidies, money pouring into the system, federal subsidies in particular, uh, to an absence of effective competition you can compete on the wrong grounds, who's got the best climbing wall instead of who's got the best job when they get out of college, uh, and um, an, an, an opacity toward the quality of the product that you're purchasing and the, and the price that you will ultimately pay. I mean, that, that, those are these two things, and it's driven a lot by the financing and driven a lot by how we paid people. Um, I used to remind um, my, my pupils at, uh, in, in the Congress, the, the 535 geniuses that I that, that if you looked at Medicare. That you worked for, actually. <laughs> that I worked for, yes. And they reminded me that I was staff every day. Yes, it's true. Um, but I, I said, if you look at Medicare, think about what you're doing. You've got part A, that makes sure that some hospitals get paid. Part B, make sure that some doctors get paid. Part C, make sure that you know, some insurance companies get paid. And part D, make sure the drug companies get paid. Those are four silos that don't talk to each other, and there's no patient to be found in there anywhere. And you're shocked that we're not getting good results? I mean. It, the, the payment systems have to be ones that drive coordination, as they are now starting to. Um, they can't be open-ended, right, because the, the most dangerous economic phenomenon is other people's money. And if you've got an unlimited supply of other people's money, it's fine until you run out of other people, and then, then it all goes bad. And so, we, you know, we've had too much of that. So we, we're now seeing a lot of um, difficult changes for these, for these hospitals, doctors, and other providers because they are getting capitated payments that put them at financial risk if they end up spending more than uh, than one would expect. And, That's and a bad word, by the way. I know. It's now called pay for performance, not capitated. Uh, not unlimited amounts of other people's money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but these those those ways of delivering the funds are important, and I think underneath it, you, you do also have to remember that in the end, both of these decisions, decisions about health uh, services and decisions about education services are in some ways core ethical decisions in America. And I have always felt that it is best to place the locus of control for the money in health care ultimately with the family and the family's advisors because they are the ones who are ethically best situated to make any tough calls, especially the end of life things that you hear so much about. Similarly, you've got to get the, the control ultimately into the families uh, in America, because they are the ones best situated to make the tough decisions about what, what education services they're going to pursue once we get the data and the technologies lined up to give people not one size fits all education, but the kind of uh, uh, education that best suits a very heterogeneous population with lots of different kinds of problems. We, you can't build a system where, the, where the, that ultimate decision making is divorced from the money or, it, or the end game is not going to work. Well, one of the reasons that Doug is good on TV is because he's so quotable. 
and quotable these days means tweetable. So I will give you one of his <laughs> lines that I think is very tweetable, which is, you know something is wrong when paper performance is considered a radical innovation. <laughs> <laughs> and his Twitter feed, by the way, as you know, is at DJH Eakin, E-A-K-I-N. And I've been told that this whole Excellence in Education Summit is not one of the top trending topics on Twitter. And the hashtag is, John Bailey? EIE13, very um, hot trending hashtag. So if you want to tweet uh, Doug's, um, Doug's Twitter handle, by the way, my Twitter handle is at Tevi Troy. Do you guys have Twitter handles, either of you? Yeah, DMC at ccf.org. Say that slower, please. <laughs> <laughs> DMC at ccf.org. A Levine 014. A Levine 014. I would argue that mine and Doug's are slightly easier to remember. Doug, do you want to add something? <laughs> I, I just, uh, since Full, transparency and full disclosure is a theme of this. Um, I, I, I'm not allowed to use my own Twitter account. Uh, the staff has the password. Uh -huh. And that's because I, I have a tendency to become too quotable. Yeah, I can see that. All right, Alan. <laughs> you know, I think Say that, something tweetable. <laughs> I think something that's very relevant to what you're dealing with in education reform itself is first the, the notion that um, you know, we're only responsible for what we do. And so it, I hear a lot, you, you often hear a lot of reasons why some students can't excel or aren't excelling and others are excelling. And I, in my view, I think based on my experience in healthcare, I think those are nothing more than excuses. And the reason I say that is some of the way we're being measured in healthcare now, which I think draws some great parallels to what's happening in education is, one example specifically is uh, the measurement of Medicare cost per beneficiary. That's something hospitals are being measured by. And it's the cost for that patient for the three days prior to admission and the 30 days post admission. Mm -hmm. A lot happens three days prior to admission and 30 days post admission, most of which the hospital has very little to do with. Mortality in readmissions, excuse me, not readmissions, but mortality. If somebody leaves the hospital and gets hit by a truck, it goes against the hospital's mortality data. And, and so, we can't sit around as hospitals and say, yeah, but we have nothing to do with what happens after we leave the hospital. Why is the cost per uh, beneficiary being uh, tagged to our hospital? Well, everybody says, well, we don't really care about that. It's your problem. This is what we're measuring. Now, it's true that a lot of it we can't control, but as a hospital system. You can't system, ban trucks, right? <laughs> well, as, but as a hospital system, it's forced us to think, okay, what can we do? We can develop partnerships with home health agencies post-discharge. We can develop partnerships with post-discharge nursing facilities, and we can do things to identify what are the most high-risk things that cause readmissions or that cause post-discharge mortality. For instance, uh, not complying with your drug regimen that you're discharged with. So we've in invested a lot in trying to improve education, post-discharge education for people to know you need to take your drugs. If you can't take your drugs, we're gonna get you with this home health agency to talk, you need to call them, we'll intervene. Why? To avoid the readmission so we don't get the penalty, and to improve our mortality, and uh, to reduce the cost so they don't, you, you don't end up with the post 30 day cost of added back into the Medicare cost per beneficiary. This is what Doug started, and it's the right way to do it, even though I would argue a lot of it we can't control. Push that back over to the, to the argument about schools. What happens to a student, when you, the, a lot of the excuses you hear, they don't have a family at home. They don't have uh, the resources. They, true, it's all true. But somebody's got, if we want these students to learn, somebody has to say, all right, we own it. We're gonna do something about it. And I think that's the difficulty, part of the difficulty we're facing right now as we try to transform education is making sure there's ownership. No doubt, you need parents, you need family involvement, but, but, but local schools, knowing that there's standards that we're measuring against, knowing that there's standards against, that we're measuring against, what do we need to do to get to those standards? Mm -hmm. And how do we develop partnerships uh, upstream and downstream of the, of the four walls of the school to make sure that these students are learning? In, in Florida, when we did these reforms in 2000, and when Governor Bush first took office in 1999, he, it wasn't enough just to say if the kid can't meet the standard, we're gonna hold them back. No, we don't wanna punish children or families. We said, okay, if we have to hold them back, we're gonna hold them back, and we're gonna take the political grief that comes with that, but we're gonna provide summer reading programs so that these kids can be, we, we, we're gonna invest whatever we have to do to help them achieve those standards. And those were, that was the downstream effect of the reform. Finally, I'll just say this. One of the things that, uh, example I'll use, I mentioned, I really 
do use anecdote a lot. In Louisiana, when I got to Louisiana, uh, I was the Secretary of Health for Governor Jindal there from 2008, his first term, for about three years. And I'll give my predecessor the credit. As he was leaving office, he said we were, we were ranked 49th in, child, in vaccinations for infants, okay? And we said, you know what, we, th this is something we know we can measure, we know we can see some achievable improvement if we focus on it. So the Lions, chipmunks, antelopes, we said let's not chase chipmunks, let's go after the antelope. Let's find something that we know if we do well will lead to better health for, for avoidable complications for these kids as, as they develop. So we partnered with physicians all over the state. We put some very modest incentives in the Medicaid program for, for doctors that achieve a certain percentage of their patients that, that receive the vaccinations. And you know what? Within two years, we went from ranked 49th in the nation to ranked number, number two behind Massachusetts. We ranked number two. Louisiana, one of the poorest, worst health systems in the country was able to show that kind of improvement because we developed a metric that mattered and we made it a priority. Can I just, like really, to, uh, can I just say one thing? Sure, about, please. I, I, and it has to do with sort of the dynamics of reform. And, you know, Alan mentioned this, this poor uh, business where he gets charged with the, the mortality when, when the, uh, the discharged patient gets hit by a truck. And, and, but, and, and, that's, and that's a highly imperfect um, system. We, we know that. Um, point number one is, don't let some imperfections stop reforms. I, I, I always get nervous when people say oh, we can't do that because we don't understand it well enough yet. We know we can do better. Let's try to do better. Second is that's what then drives the kind of systems talking to each other um, that was mentioned earlier because you know now hospitals are, are thinking, okay, what's the clinically appropriate and cost efficient place to discharge this person to? Is it a skilled nursing facility? Can they do home health? What, what, what is the right way? And now instead of just being silos, Having a, an even imperfect metric of measurement and a, and a standard drives the, the communication and makes the system more efficient. I think that's, that's a real lesson. That's a, that's a good point. The next question I want to ask about is something that we health geeks are aware of, but maybe people in the education world are less aware of. It's something called ACOs, Accountable hmm. Care Organizations. Now, they are part of the Affordable Care Act. They try to encourage the development of ACOs, although I, I will note that um, Toby's organization, when they saw the original rule, on how they would work said absolutely no way will we participate in this form of ACO and there's a bunch of uh, I guess humorous and the comments. Rule changed. They did change the rule but large <laughs> yeah. part because you guys weighed, it, weighed in so strongly because you were seen it as, as the model but there, there are a couple of um, I guess uh, arch observations about ACOs. One is that um, an ACO is an HMO but on steroids and the other one was that there are three mythical creatures out there. There's the Easter Bunny, the Loch Ness Monster and an ACO that actually saves money. So <laughs> this notion of the ACO is supposed to get shared savings by doing a better coordination of care and then any leftover money from what it would have cost if you hadn't coordinated care, which seems like an obvious thing you should have done anyway, but any, anything left over is then returned mostly to the government, although you theoretically would get a piece of it for being part of that organization that, that saved the money. I would like to ask each of our panelists what they think about this notion of ACOs, whether they think they could work, and whether there's any applicability to education. I'd like Toby to go first. How come I, why don't you let somebody else go first? Right, Alan, you can go first. Well, you know, the, the predecessor to the ACO was actually developed in Florida by Governor Bush. Um, it, was a, uh, it was called the Provider Service Network, and the idea behind it was just what, the, actually, it, it's important to distinguish between organizations like the Cleveland Clinic, which are highly sophisticated, very integrated. I believe your physicians are mostly employed, if not all, right? Yes. So in the world that we're in, the doctors are entrepreneurs. They're not all employed, although it's moving in that direction. So what we've figured out is how, how do we find a way to get this big blob of providers to work together for the goal of improving uh, number one, cost and quality, and then also improving communication between providers. And so we developed in our Medicaid reforms that were approved by uh, the, the federal government in 2005, uh, it was the largest, most sweeping reforms of Medicaid in the United States. The idea was to allow consumers to choose between an HMO or a provider service network, or what's now an ACO. The idea behind an ACO is, okay, as opposed to paying a fixed premium, you could keep a fee-for-service model with some tweaks to it, although it's very imperfect. And then at the end of the day, what, 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 if you can achieve savings on a per-person basis, 
all in, you know, taking an, a beneficiary, what did you spend on that beneficiary for the whole year versus what you thought you were going to spend based on your original projections. If you spend less, then we would share, the government would share the savings with that provider community. And it actually has worked. Um, it, it works really well when you're, when you're moving from an unwieldy fee-for-service system to something that's a little bit more organized. There's some argument that if you move, that, that, that the HMO model is much more disciplined than the ACO model because you're paying a fixed sum and you have an independent third-party observer, the HMO, that's deciding how big the network's gonna be, who's gonna be in it, uh, as opposed to an ACO. Um, it's a little, the rules are a little bit more strict in an HMO world versus the ACO world. An interesting dynamic that at the very beginning of reform that I pointed out, Dr. Zeke Emanuel, who's a, a very smart physician, um, Rahm Emanuel's Ethicist. brother. Ethicist. Uh, an ethicist, that's right. correct. Who, who, let's be clear, he worked at, at NIH and then he went over to work at OMB in the Obama administration on the, AC, uh, on the ACA reform. On, and on one of his time. books, one of his books, he, he, made, he, he went out of his way, went way out on that limb, kind of teetering at the very edge of the limb, and he said, those who argue for a, a single payer system seem to forget that the organizations that tend to have the resources, the technology, and all the piece components to create an organized system are the very insurance companies that the single payer advocates don't like. A lot of people don't like insurance companies. There's times where I don't like them, but the, at the end of the day, it's an, arm's length, it's an arm's length negotiation where the insurance company sees the whole picture, the cost upstream and downstream of the hospital, and they're trying to piece together a system. Effectively, that's what they've tried to do with ACOs. I, I think, I think my, my only consternation about an ACO is and the reason I think they're gonna struggle a little bit as they really take hold is you've got primary care doctors and you have specialists. And for ACO to fundamentally work, you have to decrease, you have to decrease the utilization on the specialty side. It really does empower primary care doctors unlike it's ever been done before, but to some degree you're pitting primary care doctors against specialists. In, in, a, in a world where uh, they're all entrepreneurs on their own, that's hard to do. Uh, when you get more organization around the system, particularly if you can change the way they're paid. In other words, if they're employed and you can change the payment model, and, and I think Dr. Costco is better qualified to talk about how that's worked for the Cleveland Clinic. If you can get to that place, I think it can work very well. Uh, Doug, I'd love to, uh, you also talk a little bit about the numbers. What are the potentials for savings in ACO, if you know them? Um, so the, the idea of the ACO, um, it, it, it's like Tevi said, it's a, it's a mythical creature and it's an utterly desirable, right? An, an organization that's a, that coordinates care, um, does it less cost, gets more high quality outcomes. I mean, being opposed to ACOs is like being opposed to puppies, kittens, and sunshine. I mean, just can't be. Um, <laughs> but what we have is an actual creature, and I have some reservations, and, and they come from, uh, even after relaxing the rule, the notion that there is this, well, again, one thing, we can piece it together and tell you how it works and, and we can get the savings out, which are, you know, what everyone's after in, in, the, in the health system. And it's, it defies the economics of, of that we've learned in many other industries. We don't have manufacturers of one size with one, you know, a way of doing business. I mean, a manufacturing facility is, is an accountable care organization for a product. I mean, it coordinates and everybody pulls together to get the best possible product out there and make it the money that they can and save as much as possible on costs. And we have large ones, we have small ones. It, it has a lot to do with the geography. Our, our health systems don't all face the same geography. We have rural, we have urban. Um, it has a lot to do with the populations and they're very different across the United States. And I'm very concerned that the pursuit of this ACO will set back the general desirability of that kind of organization being more dominant in the, in the healthcare world. That's that's the, my top concern. And in the process, can you explain a little why it will set back that pursuit? Uh, because it won't work. <laughs> well, that's the reason. And, and it'll cost more money. I mean, you know, and then everyone will say, "Well, you said you're supposed to save money, and and, and this is a disaster." And so I'm, I'm I'm worried about that. It's one of the risk points, one of the real risk points, I think, in, in the reform. And that would be the you know the same, the same lesson I think would apply in, in education reform where you got you do have to be cognizant of the, the tremendous heterogeneity of the problems that are out there, and let the appropriate scale of organization uh, go after them. I think that's a big deal. 
there was a, the potential for lots of, of presumed savings in healthcare because a, a lot of it is not the prices being charged, that's some of it, but a lot of it is just uh, inappropriate utilization of services. And, you know, if, if the organization's looking at that and, and, you know, estimates in some cases are huge, you know, we, that you could take 300, 400, uh, 500 billion dollars a year out of the system uh, if, you, if you get rid of inappropriate utilization. And that was the ACO dream, go get that money, but I'm nervous about whether it will work. Yeah, well, I, we were nervous about how it was going to work, too. And so let me, t if I think you have to understand what sort of an organization we are. Uh, first of all, we're a group practice, um, and all of us are employed. Uh, there are 3,000 of us. Uh, we all have a salary, uh, a fixed salary. Uh, we do not have tenure. We all have one-year appointments. We have annual professional reviews where, and our salaries are adjusted on the basis of that. So essentially, and, and do we you fire people based on those? Yes, we do. In fact, we've even gone, if you will, to force ranking of positions. And so the people at the bottom well, of that ranking that's extremely applicable to this. Huh? So, and this is exactly the, the, the issue in education, yeah. one of them. It's the same yeah. thing. So, so, we, you know, for the, so this is, you can imagine when we started to say to docs, we're going to force rank you. Um, everybody knew who belonged at the bottom, but no one was willing to say anything about it or do anything about it. So we're at right. it now. Um, and it, you can imagine the chaos in the organization as we go at that. But anyhow, so that's, that's the organization we are. So we looked at, and, and frankly, we, we work together. Um, we're, it's a very collegial group. It's not uh, people who are trying to feather their own nests because the, it's not, you don't have the opportunity to do that. Essentially, we are what we get what we get. So when the ACOs came along, we said, you know, we frankly don't know how these are going to work. Uh, and we didn't think we either had enough capability to understand uh, the population that we're going to be working with or how the primary care physicians were going to work with the specialist um, and, or how uh, ultimately uh, the payments would work. And so we took a pass on it. Uh, and uh, what we said was, we're going to try and learn how to most efficiently do, it, do this. So we set up three or four different models, uh, and over the last year we've begun to work those into our organization and see how they worked. And it's very clear that one doctor with uh, a certain number of assistants has been the most efficient uh, way to run these ACOs, and, and so we're going to begin to try and roll this out. Now the question we have, if you look at who's signed up for the ACOs, it's relatively small groups of primary care physicians who do not have a relationship with the hospital. That's right. So the question really becomes uh, pitting uh, the specialist in the hospital against the primary care physician. He's going to do everything he possibly can to keep him out of that because anytime someone gets sick, it's essentially costs him money. So, you know, so this is an imperfect system, and if you look at the five-year experiment that had been done with ACOs, you see the, almost the perfect bell-shaped curve. You know, some of them have lost money, some of them have broken even, and uh, a, some of them have made a little bit of money, but the amount of savings there has not been uh, particularly significant. Now, the concern about ACOs, if in fact ACOs don't work, and they don't take money out of the system, uh, and save money, and we don't find a better way to do it, it's going to be death by a thousand cuts uh, by just taking down uh, providers' uh, payments one after another after another after another just uh, to, to meet our objectives as decreasing the cost of health care across the country. So frankly, I hope we can find a system that works. I'm not sure we got it now. Uh, uh, let me add one thing to that please. really quick. And Doug, did you want to get in after? The you want yeah, to the after? Okay. The so the Alan Doug. The par part of the danger, and again, there's always unintended consequences, and, and it's why you have to really think through any reform, and that is with ACOs, the whole idea of the ACO is, to, is sort of almost a transference of risk to the primary care physician group. That's, you know, for exa and I'm setting aside the Cleveland Clinic because their model is very different. But out in the real world, uh, where most hospitals are not in the same kind of position where you have these large in, in integrated groups, you have a primary care group that becomes an ACO. And because their incentive financially is reduce services, um, guess what happens? We're starting to see patients sent home from the ER that probably needed to stay 
um, and they'll come back and, and end up as a revisit, end up as a, 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 an un, unintent, unplanned revisit back to the ER. Um, you'll see patients put in what's called observation status instead of being admitted to the hospital. And, th th and it's all about the dollar. It's all about the, the dollar. And that's what, from my perspective, that's what concerns me the most about any time you have a transference of risk where the people that are making the medical decisions have a financial incentive. It's dead wrong to incentivize a doctor to admit a patient to a hospital. It's also dead wrong to incentivize a doctor not to admit a patient to the hospital. Doctors should do what they do at the Cleveland Clinic is treat what the, determine what the patient's needs are medically and take care of that patient's need. Okay. That ought to be the driving Okay, factor. I can't contain myself here. Uh, so, so, you know, if you look at the various models uh, of, of what there, uh, there are uh, and how uh, physicians get paid, you can incent them to do more, you can incent them to do less. Uh, now, if one of the lessons that I learned, we, we for a long time looked after the Kaiser uh, patients uh, for their heart surgery in Cleveland. Uh, and Kaiser has an incentive for the physicians to, to keep costs down, right? Mm -hmm. They get, they, if, if they don't, and so the physician can actually benefit by keeping the cost of healthcare down. Now, interesting observation. The patients that were referred to us for heart surgery were the sickest of the group and frequently always thought that they should have come to see me five years previously. Uh, and so I think that in, that's a perverse incentive. So I would like to see physicians not incented to do more, which we are not, or not incented to do less. And that's one of the reasons we have not gone out and had an insurance product uh, that, that we own. Uh, we think that there ought to be an arm's length uh, distance between the person who makes the decision and the person who's doing the paying. That's exactly what, that's what Zeke Emanuel was talking about in his book, and it's true that when you have an arm's length payer, it, 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 it gives you the ability to advocate for the model that works for your patients and uh, doesn't put perverse incentives in the hands of people who are making medical decisions. And that's, to me, the biggest concern I have about uh, the ACO model. I just wanted to say that this, this issue of ranking physicians, th this is a big deal. And, and um, in my first life, I was a college professor and ultimately the chairman of the economics department at Syracuse University where effectively the dean decided to, to have an ACO. I mean, he just said, look, you know, we are a large, expensive private university that, that has Ivy League uh, level tuition and, and bad education, and we're not going to survive. <laughs> and, and he was right. And bad weather. <laughs> and bad weather. <laughs> um, and, and he was right. And so there were, there were uh, clear pressures put on uh, chairs to, to deliver better, in, in, in particular classroom instruction and educational outcomes. And, um, the way we did it is we paid people based on the quality of their teaching, and they said, there's no way we, you can do this, and, but you can. And I, I sat in every professor's classes during every se semester, and we ranked everyone in the department, and everyone knew who the bad teachers were, and sure enough, we, we, but we said so out loud. And were you able to do anything about it with tenure? Um, yeah, salaries depended on it. Okay. And I, you know, I, had, I, had, I had, you know, tenured full professors who did not get a raise during my time as chairman. Probably one of the reasons I'm not there anymore, but that's a different <laughs> story. Um, but a lesson in the, the second lesson of this I, that I think, think is important is you can't just do that. You also have to, to change the other regulations that surround uh, this. And in my case, the regulations were everybody had a, a four course teaching load, two in the fall semester, two in the spring semester, you know, as if God had laid this down on one of the tablets. And, and, and that was crazy. I had good teachers who weren't particularly good researchers, and they should have been teaching all the time. And I had some good researchers who should not have set foot in the classroom. And I finally got the dean to agree with it, that we, we had to have some flexibility in who was delivering different services. And that's going to be a big deal in healthcare reform, where on the ground, state level regulations and licensing rules and things like that are, are going to make it hard to actually modify the delivery systems in the way that everyone thinks we should, because the regs are too rigid. So it's not just this the top level stuff. It's on the ground regulation as well. Yeah, and one of our concerns is, you know, what happens to research, what happens to teaching in the academic medical yeah. centers across the country. Now, one of the things that we have done uh, is we say, look, we do not pay you on the basis of your, uh, the amount of clinical productivity. We pay you on your total contribution to the organization. And that may be your teaching, your researching, your managing, etc. And frankly, there's some people who never touch a patient that get paid more than people who spend all day doing it. 
Uh, a number of you have mentioned that you've read uh, Zeke Emanuel's book. I read his most recent book, which is called The Brothers Emanuel, <laughs> which basically <laughs> details how he, Ari, and Rom used to beat the crap out of anyone they didn't like in suburban Chicago growing up. So uh, I think they've taken that their approach. Their behavior hasn't changed much. <laughs> yeah. And they've taken that approach to their professional careers. <laughs> <as well. laughs> uh, so we're, we're just about out of time. This has been a really interesting panel. Uh, I will tell a little bit about my thoughts and some of the takeaways, which are that Technology is hard. It's useful, it's helpful, and it's hard. And the progress we've made in the healthcare system has not happened overnight, requires great care and thought and preparation into how you make it happen. And that the providers really challenge themselves, really think about this issue, and, and really integrate technology into their systems are going to do better than the ones who just say, oh, look, I got an iPad. So I, I think that's one quick takeaway. But I'd love to ask the, the panelists uh, for each of them for one quick takeaway, given that we have very little time. And uh, Toby rightfully noted that I was picking on him by going to him first. So I'm going to try to spread the love. Doug, you're going to go first on this. Then Alan, then Toby will finish it off. Um, I, I think the, the main takeaway I've had from this panel is, you know, it, it's one thing to talk about these grand policy changes. But the biggest changes have to be cultural changes inside the organizations. And uh, that does take a long time. And the financial incentives can drive that, uh, but, but you know, other social incentives drive that as well. And in schools, the communities they're in, and you know, having the data and aspiring to, be, to do better is as, as important as, those, as the payment systems in many cases. And that, that's really something to keep an eye on. Alan. I think something Doug said earlier, which is, uh, you, know, you go after the big thing that matters and understanding that reform isn't perfect and move the ball forward. Don't, don't wait, um, as the speaker was saying last night, don't wait, move the ball forward, and then the conversation is no longer about whether to do reform, it's just fixing the things that weren't perfect. Right. So my takeaway is, is to do that. Toby. Yeah, well, we're seeing a very interesting thing going on in the United States right now. This is probably, uh, effect, this is affecting 18% of the GDP in, in the United States. This is the biggest social change that's probably happened in the United States in the last 100 years. Uh, and it is making absolutely everybody in the healthcare delivery system incredibly anxious. And I think uh, probably rightly so, the population of the United States uh, very anxious and incredibly divided over whether they like this or not. Now everybody asks me if this is gonna be a good thing or not. This is an ex a social experiment and a an economic experiment that's going on right now, we're not going to know the results of this for some time. If you stop and think about the law, the law was 2,700 pages. There's now 27,000 pages of regulations that have been written to go with that. God knows, you know, how this is going to all turn out. Uh, but we can be sure of one thing. The law today will not be the same law that we, uh, uh, five years from now. It's going to be modified and changed, and, and we're in the process of doing this experiment, and the experiments change along the way. I completely agree with that point by Toby, and I would, I would just supplement the point by saying that the law already is not what the law is right. was passed. I mean, they got rid of the Class Act, for example, and they suspended the employer mm -hmm. mandate for a while. So there, there, this is going to be a very uh, evolving process, a constantly evolving process, and the law will indeed be very different in five years, ten years, and, and going forward, but it remains fascinating to watch, and I hope it works out better for our system. Now, I, I just want to say thank you to this panel. You would think that we had been a traveling road show since we were so seamlessly integrated and we have been doing this for months together, but this is the first time we have sat down together as a panel, and I want to thank all the panelists for their good work and you for your good listening skills. Good job.